one of the things that I do is, <clears throat> is I, I try to, I'm, my, sense, my approach is scientific. I consider myself a scientist. And so I'm very much uh, into the, I, you know, I don't have a degree in science, but I have been trained in science. And I very much advocate the scientific method, which is you don't believe anything until it's been tested. And I also believe the, the dictum of our, the late Carl Sagan, he said, the more extraordinary the claim is, the more extraordinary the proofs that should be required before you accept that claim. And, and while I'm still a believer in a lot of the different aspects of things that go on, I've also become somewhat of a skeptic because I've, all, I've heard so many claims made that this and that was going to happen on such and such a day, going back to literally to the late 60s, that, you know, that hasn't happened. And so what I try to do is I try to look at what is the real substantial knowledge, what is the real substantial information that anybody can verify by doing the research or by the, doing the practice themselves. And that is not to say that I don't believe necessarily in, in metaphysical realities and higher dimensions and all that. I generally don't deal with that. I do deal with the higher dimensional concepts, but what I try to do is I lay down a foundation. For example, all of the platonic solids, the, the five regular platonic solids, the five regular polyhedra, which in my advanced classes is what we build and study, um, are, are uh, symbols, if you will, or representations of higher dimensional realities. But what I do is I don't come in on the first class and start talking about higher dimensional realities. What I do is I take step by step from the known and work towards the unknown. And then I believe when you get to that stage, you have a basis for, um, you know, the idea of science is, is you can get way out there with, with theories that are extremely abstruse and very abstract, but you should always be able to retrace your steps from, from from the abstract and the unknown back to something that's solid and real and identifiable and known. And that's where I start. I, I, teach, I teach metaphysics very much like if you were going to go and learn mathematics. You know, you don't study calculus if you haven't learned arithmetic. So I basically start and I teach the symbolic language and I say, here's the symbolic language. Here's how it applies to the study of, of symbolism and mythology. Here's how it applies to the study of art and architecture. Here's how it applies to the study of uh, biology and biochemistry. Here's how it applies to the study of astronomy. Here's how it applies uh, to the study of, of consciousness change and so forth. Um, but first I introduce the basic principles and that's, that's the approach that I take. So you pick up the instruments in hand, you have a compass in one hand, a straight edge in the other hand, and then you proceed to, to do the exercises. And the exercises are essentially the, the same as, as were done back in the days of Pythagoras and Plato and Euclid. And uh, tonight we're not going to be talking so much about sacred geometry. <clears throat> I'm going to give you kind of an overview of the, the, the total program that I've put together over basically the last 10 years. I, I started into these studies uh, literally when I was still in high school. Um, I started studying sacred geometry uh, in 1973 and taught my first class on it in 1980 and I've been exploring and studying it ever since. Um, I've gone into other subjects that, that really intrigue me that it sometimes run parallel, sometimes overlap. For example, I'm very, very keenly interested in mythology and ancient traditions. I'm very interested in architecture because architecture is, is, is the, the, the prime manifestation of sacred geometry in, in our plane of existence. I'm also extremely interested in earth changes and have uh, actually completed, a, I got so interested in it that I wanted to actually get a, a, a grounding and I want a scientific grounding so I took a two-year program in geology about 15 years ago, uh, graduated with honors from that and then I've gone basically uh, all of my vacations when I have free time, my vacations are doing field research, geological field research and I'm going to show you some of that tonight. Um, I'm very much interested in earth changes. I think earth changes are extremely critical and important at this time. And I also believe there is so much misinformation about earth changes out there that part of what I feel like I want to do is try to clarify things and put things on a solid grounding so people can really understand what constitutes a, a real scenario of earth change and what is just complete fantasy. And I do think that there are, uh, I mean, there are a lot of fantastical scenarios out there back and forth on the internet and some of the in some of the, the books that I've read and so forth. Some of them have an element of truth in it, but then they take that element of truth and they go way out of bounds and, um, and there are real earth changes that have happened and will happen again. And if you go back and you look at the pattern of earth changes that has unfolded in the last 
um, you can pick any date of time. I mean, if we start talking plate tectonics, then we're going back, you know, millions of years. If we start talking climate change and ice age cycles and so forth, we're going back tens of thousands of years. But in any case, um, what I try to do is I try in my teachings about the earth science, I say try to go. Here's what the here's what the geologists have discovered. Here's what they have. Here's their theories, here's the research, here's the evidence, here's what the geophysicists have said, here's what the astronomers have said, here's what the paleontologists have said. How does that now jive with ancient traditions? According to what the ancients said. So actually there's a new school of thought that has arisen in the last decade or so. It's, it's called geomythology. And there are actually trained geologists who are realizing that a lot of the ancient myths have real solid geological information embedded in it. Most of us of our age in here, when we were growing up, there was a prevailing paradigm of earth change. It was, if it, whether it was taught to you directly in school or merely implied, the idea was is that everything happened extremely slowly and uniformly over long expanses of time. And it was generally considered heresy to talk about catastrophes. I'm sure a lot of you have read Velikovsky and are familiar with the, the, the controversy that surrounded Velikovsky's ideas back in the 50s when he started proposing catastrophic scenarios for earth change and he was labeled a crackpot. The problem was some of the things that Velikovsky said were pretty much out in left field, but he had a lot of really good solid stuff also that got contaminated essentially by association with the stuff that he presented that, that wasn't verifiable. Um, and so what happened is a lot of the, the, the rank and file scientists basically suppressed his work basically by ignoring it or by you know denouncing it and so forth. Yet a lot of the stuff that he's that he talked about has has held up. Primarily the stuff where he what one of the things if you've ever read anybody here read uh, Earth in Upheaval? That's probably his best work because essentially what he does in there is he collates geological evidence with mythical and legendary evidence and shows how the two are very compatible with one another. And uh, some of his other books like Ages and Chaos I think are a little bit more strained and, and, and haven't held up as well. But in any case, there's, um, there was sort of a, a revitalization of catastrophic scenarios that sort of um, had a false start in the 50s, again in the 60s. Several things came out in the 70s. Most of the people who came out and tried to propose that certain things that, in, that had happened in Earth history were catastrophic, were generally considered out on the fringe. However, in 1980, something happened. There was three teams of scientists that simultaneously published papers uh, dealing with the sudden demise of the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago. And they all three proposed a cosmic scenario in which something from space encountered the Earth and uh, provoked a lot of uh, havoc and so forth. And at that point, that was sort of the turning point for the scenarios of modern catastrophism. Would you like to come in? I got really interested in all, in, I, I was interested in ca uh, catastrophism in the 70s, but I didn't really start studying it until I met old Richard Noon. Some of you may have read his book. And he and I would get into it, uh, get into a lot of arguments over it. And, and, but he put me onto a lot of interesting things, such as Charles Hapgood. And I don't know if you're familiar with Hapgood. If some of you have, have familiar with earth changes in here, you'll be familiar with, with Hapgood. Uh, anyways, Hapgood did some really good work on pole shifts. Probably the best work that was done on pole shifts was, was Hapgood. And um, although it turned out when Hapgood did his revision of his book, he, he sort of rebutted his own theory um, of his, his cause of, of earth shift, which Richard knew, uh, pole shifts, which Richard Noon uh, ignored the fact that, that Hapgood had, had abandoned his original theory that, that a polar shift was triggered by an eccentric ice mass at one or both of the poles. And he abandoned that idea, but when Richard Noon wrote his book, 55-2000, back in 1988, he pretended that Hapgood never abandoned his own original idea and, and picked up on it. So he and I would get into some, some good arguments, and those arguments really inspired me to do my own research. And uh, I went to Hapgood as a source. He has a bibliography of about 350 sources. And uh, over the next few years, I collected almost every one of those, studied them, and then used those as the basis for the field trips that I started going on. Um, so 
I've got about 25 years of research, pretty solid research into earth change, which means that I've read most of the, the, the what's considered the, the fringe stuff, but I've also, you know, regularly peruse all of the, the geological journals and so forth, the paleontological journals, and then I've supplemented that with uh, considerable correspondence with people doing work in the field, cutting edge work in the field, and then also my own field, extensive, extensive field research uh, to try to actually document the evidence for catastrophic earth change that's out there in the landscape. And what I've put together is a program to try to um, give people essentially the eyes to see our own, the, the story that's embedded in the landscape around us. Because there is an amazing story, and it's a story that, that, that requires being able to read the geological language. And, and that's what I, one of the things that I try to do in my program is to convey uh, that method, a, a, a geological literacy, so that when you go out and you look at a hill, it's no longer just a hill. That hill tells a story. You know, a valley is no longer just a valley. A rock sitting out in the middle of a field didn't just appear there spontaneously by magic. There was a process that brought that rock to that field. And it may have been a rock that was once part of the bedrock in, this, in the position that it's now located, but it also may have been a rock that was transported many, many miles by some force that is no longer active in the landscape. So what I try to do is to to inculcate in people the ability to visualize forces that once were manifesting in the landscape that are no longer active in order to give them a real sense of what has actually happened. Okay, and only then do I believe it's possible to start thinking about what could happen in the future, you see.